everyone. So I have the pleasure of introducing our keynote. Blythe Masters is a financial services and technology innovator. She's a founding partner at Motive Partners, a fintech specialized private equity firm. She also serves as the president of Motive Capital Corp. Previously, she was a senior executive at JP Morgan with a career spanning 27 years. Blythe will be sitting down with renowned philanthropist and chairman of the Milken Institute, Michael Milken. Please welcome them both to the stage. So Blythe, it's so good to see you. Likewise, nice well, to be here. Most of people didn't know that you were 14 years old when you started at J.P. Morgan. They were wondering, <laughs> how could you have spent all those decades at, at J.P. Morgan? Yeah, I, I don't think J.P. Morgan realized either. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> and I, Blythe has a couple of other things. Uh, one, she served as CEO of Digital Asset blockchain fintech company that amazingly was behind the infrastructure project that the Australian uh, Securities Exchange operates on. And she's been on the Brookings, hopefully we'll be moving her over to the Milken Institute's uh, Center for Public Health Task Force on Financial Stability. So today uh, for our little group here in Los Angeles, uh, on May, it's uh, May 25th, 2022. We have the honor, really, in having Blythe with us today, who's been a leader and really uh, a trailblazer in financial technology and other areas. And so let's start with an easy question, Blythe. Uh -oh. uh, technology is providing us enormous uh, opportunities across all sectors, all societies. There is no industry that is not subject to disintermediation. If you had to pick one, just one of the most exciting technologies that will continue to cause innovation, what would it be? The great thing about these questions where you get asked to pick one is there's no one actually up here to prevent me from picking three. Um, <laughs> well, if you want to, I'll Other give than you, you three. Okay. <laughs> so, so I thought about this question um, and realized that uh, probably most people in the room would expect me to talk about some form of distributed ledger technology, blockchain, web 3.0, or whatever we're calling the space nowadays. Um, and it would be unfair on that area of innovation, because that's a big thing in its own right, uh, not to pay it some attention uh, when giving an answer to a question like this. DLT and blockchain have the potential to render radically more efficient many of the arcane processes that uh, we, you and I, don't experience day to day firsthand, but go on in the inner workings of financial services. Uh, and that promise today is as yet unlocked. There's a lot going on in the blockchain space, but many of the use cases fall far, far short of the kind of radical uh, efficiency, security, processing gains that that space uh, can deliver. And my view has been for a long time that. Uh, it's a, a when and not an if. Uh, the when uh, continues to uh, roll out uh, by about a year every year that goes by. Um, and we could spend a long time talking about what are the impediments to change. But uh, I, I truly believe that uh, in time we will see digitization of both uh, assets and the processes around them uh, radically improve efficiency in, in financial services in particular. So that's, that's one potential candidate uh, to the question. And then the next uh, thing I thought about was, well, the thing about technology today, especially as it apply, applies to financial services, which is the space I know best, uh, is that it's not just about one technology. The real power of what's going on today is that we are witnessing the coming of age of a whole series of technologies 
that taken individually are interesting, innovative, disruptive, but taken as a whole, they represent an extra a tsunami of change and of opportunity. So the advent of cloud computing, microservices, APIs, machine learning, AI, uh, ultra personalization capabilities, I, I could go on, uh, DLT of course, it is the ability to combine all of these into especially platform uh, businesses that allow multiple different entities to conduct their business over a shared or a common infrastructure uh, with increasingly efficient interfaces that I think is uh, radically different. It has already revolutionized uh, many industries, uh, you know, from what Amazon did to what Apple has done, but it has not yet happened really in financial services. And so I, I would say the platform business, which is a bundle of technologies applied to financial services would be kind of the second thing I'd point to. And then one, if you permit me, uh, thing that I don't think many people would have expected to hear about, and therefore just for uh, interest value, I think something that very few people are paying attention to, um, which is more about disruption or avoiding it um, than innovation, is the question of what do we do about data security in a world where, qu where quantum computers become viable, either for nation states or uh, private sector, which is l not as far out as I think some of us would hope or fear, depending on your perspective. There's widespread evidence that data today are being stolen in encrypted form with only one explanation as to why that would be happening. It's, it's still now uh, decrypt later. Uh, and so the role of post-quantum cryptography, how do you secure data at rest or in transit in a world where you have uh, quantum computing resources is I think going to be a very, very interesting and hot topic over the next few years. And it's going to make Y2K, those of you that remember that, look like a, steam, a, a, a storm in a teacup. Um, because the transition from all the data that we're producing, managing, transferring, sharing today uh, encrypted in the ways that we do that today to where we need to get to is a, is a huge undertaking that's a bigger project than Y2K was. Um, Blythe, I might mention one other, and uh, that's ag tech, the vertical farming, hydro farming, yep. potential for 1% of the land, a fraction of the water, and where you can bring actually the production of food to any place in the world. Uh, we estimate that it might be eliminate a half a billion jobs if you did that. And so most countries aren't going to move there until they can figure out what happens. But I think let's you brought up financial technology. So let's talk about that for a moment. There's obviously been a meltdown in tech and growth stocks prices over the last few months. But, you know, if you were looking at it in March of 20 and you were sleeping for two and a quarter years, you, you'd still say, boy, things are, have really moved up today. What does that imply, do you think, for the future of finance? The incumbents, FinTech, obviously these are issues you're looking at as the board member of Credit Suisse. Uh, JP Morgan, Wells Fargo, and others are making enormous commitments to technology uh, to define what their relationships are in the future. What do you see these changes here in values in the last six to nine months playing, and how do you see that playing out? Well, uh, <laughs> there is there's no doubt that the, the expansion in multiples, the, the um, favoritism, some would say, that has been afforded uh, to the ultra high growth fintech space by the public markets in recent years, irrespective of when you start the measuring point. Um, it's been one of the biggest sources of C-suite expletives amongst financial <laughs> incumbents uh, in recent history. In fact, you know, certainly since about 2007 or 2008. Um, and you've seen, uh, you know, the various stages of, of grief, I guess, um, passing through uh, those same C-suites as they initially dismiss and eventually embrace um, the 
message that's coming uh, from the public market embrace. And the message that has gotten through is that if you rely on moats um, that were created, you know, variously, I don't pick your pick your number, but decades ago, um, as your source of edge in a, in a space that is serving a progressively more digitally engaged consumer, eventually you're going to lose uh, because there are others out there that are doing a better job of digital engagement, personalization, being there at the right time at the right, with the right uh, product and delivered through the right device. I put mine away so it didn't bother us, but that little thing that all the rest of you are holding. That, that, that message you know, has come home to roost uh, in uh, and amongst the major financial uh, players in the world. And this correction that we're seeing, I actually think will end up accelerating in a bizarre kind of way um, the kind of change um, that those, some might say, excessive valuations on a relative basis uh, implied. Because what those valuations implied is that these, these new fintech-powered uh, business models were going to take over the world and the incumbents were dead. Uh, they're bogged down with regulation and, and, and complexity and legacy and old technology and all this stuff. But you know, the other thing they're bogged down with is surprisingly loyal customers. And the thing that the, the new world was struggling with, in not every case, of course, but in many cases, um, was finding a sustainable, and I'm, I'm not talking in the ESG sense now, but a sustainable in the financial sense business model that um, you know, demonstrated a path to profitability, unit economics that made sense, and you know, customer acquisition costs that, that, you know, that e also make sense. Um, and so I think in this, in this correction, you're going to see a lot of consolidation. Um, you will see uh, the incumbents uh, uh, become... Uh, customers of, owners of a lot of these modern technologies, and you'll see uh, some leapfrogging done. So the, the people that have the financial resources, the financial stability to do well in this environment will take advantage uh, of the, the damage that has been done in the, the new world sector um, to essentially, whether it's beat them at their own game, embrace them, cooperate, collaborate, I don't know, uh, it'll be some mixture of all of the above. But I actually think in terms of what does the future of financial services look like, I actually think this will, be, uh, will help propel uh, that vision of the future more quickly than otherwise might have been the case. So, you know, what you've put forth here, Blythe, um, is that incumbent uh, companies that are financially strong might have the ability because of the volatility in markets to buy those that we're trying to disintermediate. And <clears throat> if you look at history, you'll find a number of examples. There was Dayton Hudson. I don't think anyone in the room has probably visited a Dayton Hudson store recently. Mm -mm. Uh, but they started Target and there is no Dayton Hudson. The company is Target today. Uh, Santa Fe bought uh, a biotech company in Boston to try to take its culture, and Roach bought Genentech, the same type of thing, to take its culture here. And uh, we were at the, in Florida at the, at the Milken Institute Dialogues not too long ago, and Abigail uh, Johnson, Abby Johnson, who r runs Fidelity, pointed out last September or October they gave the customers for the first time a chance to put an order in in dollars instead of shares. Mm. Within seven or eight months, 80% or more of all orders came in in dollars. So fractional shares and the ability to do this, just how quickly it changed when Fidelity opened that. But let's talk about Motive, an exciting company you know, for full disclosure, uh, I am a limited partner here of Motive. Uh, you could have joined any company. Uh, the success at DLT as the CEO, JP Morgan, all the responsibilities, the insight, you know, you've gotten from being a board member of a great firm, Credit Suisse. Uh, you could have gone anywhere. Why Motive? 
Well, I'm happy you went there since I'm a limited partner, but why? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for your support, <laughs> by the way. Um, so, uh, going back in time a bit, I, I left uh, JP Morgan in late 2014, and it really was actually after 27 years, and I did start when I was 12. Um, and over that time, I had done all sorts of things, you know, ranging from running big global markets businesses, you know, risk control functions, dealing with regulation, the financial crisis. I've seen all, all sorts of things, learned an incredible amount. Uh, and I left JP Morgan uh, really be because we sold, uh, I helped sell, I sold the business that I was then running for the firm, largely for regulatory reasons, which was the global commodities business and had the opportunity to stay or leave. And I decided to leave then because I had developed an itch that I wanted to scratch. I'd done a lot of innovation, but I'd done it inside the fabric of this gigantic mothership that, by the way, when I joined it, was AAA rated and had 12,000 employees and is today the behemoth that JP Morgan is. Um, but I wasn't really sure that to innovate in that, you know, with that, that safety net around you is, is really the same thing as being an entrepreneur. So, I had also developed a, a point of view, I hadn't got the Bitcoin bug in the fullest sense of the word at, at all, and uh, somewhat unfortunately I never, never did, because if I had, I probably wouldn't need to be here so still talking to anyone, but um, I, I could be working on how to give it all away, but um, well, you, or on the you beach. Well, you can do that and, and you can talk to us about how go. to change the world, There right? we go, <laughs> <laughs> amazing. <laughs> But I, you know, I had developed this, this point of view, despite having kind of somewhat poo-pooed what was going on in Bitcoin, that there was something going on in fintech that was somewhere on the spectrum of scary to very exciting, and probably both. And, and this entrepreneurial itch that I wanted to scratch, and that led to Digital Asset, a very early mover in the enterprise blockchain space, long before that was nearly as fashionable as it is today. Um, and that, that was a wild ride and, and an exciting time. And, and Australia's post-trade clearing and settlement infrastructure will be blockchain-based in due course uh, because of that company, uh, as well as others, uh, I think. Um, so when I, uh, in 2019, started thinking about uh, wanting to sort of raise my uh, eyesight above you know, being buried deep in a single company and wanted to look more broadly across the, the industry, you know, what, what brought me to Motive was, first of all, fintech specialization. Um, some might say fintech obsession. Um, and secondly, a very, diff very different operating model than the one that I observed at the other major private equity firms that I knew well from my, my prior career on Wall Street. And this, this operating model, of course, it has basically three pillars. Uh, of course, uh, motive, like any asset management firm, has investment expertise, people that know how to structure, do deals, uh, do due diligence, you know, underwrite, and so on. But added to that core capability were two others that I thought were unique. Number one, a deep bench of in-house operating experience. People like myself and many others who had uh, built, bought, sold, run, grown businesses in financial services and or fintech all the way from microscopic startups through to multi-decker billion dollar companies, and who were devoting their time to, to, to this organization um, on an exclusive basis with a view to both originating opportunities from their vast networks and uh, sometimes going in and running those businesses, but, but really engaged, not just an executive in residence waiting for a phone call, but people were really engaged in the process of investing at the firm. And, Secondly, a large, what is now 100 plus person strong in-house innovation uh, and technology capability. So technologists that have expertise in all those technologies I rattled off earlier from DLT to you know, APIs, microservices, cloud computing, you know, marketplace technologies, you name it, and who will work with our portfolio companies and with other partners in the industry to develop both IP and drive value creation plans and identify underexploited opportunities. And I thought that was different. And, you know, it was a hunch. It was a very young firm. In 2019, it was just at the end of fundraising its first ever fund, which was just shy of a half billion dollars. But two and a half years later, I can say that the, 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 the reality of Motive has proven to be, you know, exactly what I hoped it would be. And that is a, 
a very differentiated value proposition for entrepreneurs who are seeking capital to, to really you know, drive growth and value creation, to be a partner alongside them and go places that they couldn't go otherwise. And that's a very different skill than, than the more conventional find an asset cheap, slap some leverage on it, cut a lot of cost out, put in a new management team and flip it for a couple of extra turns of multiple. No offense to anyone in private equity in the room. That is a highly uh, valuable skill set, but and instead of or, and driving value creation through private capital is what I was really excited about doing as, as, a, as, an, as a wannabe entrepreneur in my own right. So that's what brought me to Motive. So um, yesterday, March, uh, talked about the five or six areas that they're focused on, the big themes that they're looking at, whether it be in software or others. So if someone is going to look at what motive is going to do in the future, what are the two or three big themes that we should look for motive to do and that are just you know, potential investable opportunities? I know in our building, when people come to see me, the first floor, four floors, we give money away, the various foundations. And we try to make money on the top two floors so we can send it down in these <laughs> vacuum tubes to the nonprofits. Uh, but it's not unusual that a person comes to see us on the fifth or sixth floor, and after we listen to their business ideas or what they're putting forth, we tell them they've just come to the wrong floor. Okay? Oh, oh, oh. They should Hush. be going to the nonprofit Hush. floors uh, with that idea. <laughs> And we might fund it on the nonprofit, <laughs> but not on the for-profit size. What are the themes <laughs> that we can count on motive the areas over the next few years to focus on? Um, well, I'll come to that in a minute, but it just it reminds me, I, I was, you know, someone sent me a graph this morning showing a multiple compression in this, in this sell-off in, in fintech and financial services and technology companies. Uh, and there's this, this one big line that starts up here and comes down here, and then there's another one that's sort of here and is sort of going, also going down, but going down less, less fast, and they kind of, they've crossed, they've converged. And um, I read with interest that the one at the top was unprofitable companies, and the one at the bottom that's now all in fashion is, is profitable companies, um, which gives you a sense of what's, what's going on in, in public markets right now. So, I'm not going to start with we're looking for profitable companies, however, because that's n not what we're all about. Um, it's part of what we're about. Uh, well, is at the end, you're making all of your companies end. profitable, right? That's where we get to. But what we <laughs> look for starts, starts with, with other things. So we're, we're a very, uh, I guess the word is thematically uh, driven uh, shop. We, we have five sectors in which we, we operate uh, within fintech. So it's banking and payments, capital markets, wealth, tech, and asset management, um, uh, and a, hor a horizontal, which is data and analytics, which can, uh, can cross all of those. And I missed one, which is insurance technologies. So for each of those areas, we, we develop you know, core investment themes. These are uh, mega trends that are, in our view, uh, intact, uh, underway, long-term trends that, that are driving value and or opportunity or risk, depending on your perspective, um, but that are going to be largely immune to the fluctuations of near-term you know, taste and public market valuations. So the first thing we look at in a company is you know, where does it sit? Does it sit at, preferably at the confluence of one or more of, of, of these big themes that we identify. Um, so I'll, I'll rattle off a few of those. Uh, I don't think any of these are, are what's hard is, is finding companies that really rhyme with these uh, in a genuine way. Um, I don't think any of these are going to be uh, you know, shocking or surprising to many people in the room. Um, we, I've already talked about the development of platform businesses. Um, so businesses that are using modern technology, efficient, modular, cloud-based, API interface, 
uh, technology uh, to, to power a network of connected constituents and customers, um, which platforms generate the opportunity for exhaust data that is valuable and can be monetized, and associated analytics that can, can be used to uh, uh, create value from that data. Platform businesses are very interesting, at, no matter what, what sector that, that we're looking at. Um, un not unrelated, there's a big trend going on in financial markets around electronification, digitization, DLT and tokenization is part of this, but not, not only. If you think about the electronification of markets, of asset classes began decades ago in the public equities markets, and it's, it's rolled its way through uh, foreign exchange and, and more recently uh, towards fixed income and, and credit markets. Uh, we just invested in, and took public via DSPAC, uh, a company called Forge that is making a marketplace in private equity securities. Uh, that we love that is very much in, in this space. So this trend of electronification of asset classes and processes supporting the execution in or the life cycle of those asset classes is another big trend that we think started a long time ago, it sure ain't finished uh, yet and, it, and is uh, continuing. Um, the rise of the self-directed investor, um, some call this you know, democratization of finance, um, but uh, or, or the retail wave, uh, uh, the, the notion that there is ongoing one of the greatest, well, the, in fact, greatest intergenerational transfer of wealth that mankind has experienced thus far uh, is something that should, should always be thought about um, because the way in which uh, the next generation, the current generation, and the last generation think about how they manage their financial lives are, in each case, radically different from the next. Um, and so companies that are able to uh, exploit that transition uh, towards a much more digitally engaged uh, customer um, and or help others do that uh, is a huge opportunity and a big, a big trend that we, uh, that we really think about, uh, we really think about a lot. So these are the types of themes we identify. And we then, with every company that we come across, no matter the stage, you know, we have early stage money, we have growth and buyout, uh, later stage money, whatever, whatever the company, we, we always try to think about, you know, what's the thesis here? Does it, does it, does it play, um, does it play into one, of, one or preferably more, preferably two or three or four of these theses? And if, and if so, then that's the kind of uh, company that we swoop on. And we find those daily in, Every one of the five sectors that I that I rattled off, and we have examples of those um, uh, in portfolio that uh, are all rev weathering the current storm actually relatively well. So one of the things uh, Blythe at Motive um, is obviously getting good managements mm. into companies and seeing them, but the interaction between these companies where one can become a customer of another's yeah. as you look at them. And I would say in the private equity industry today, you have the continued growth of shared services. Mm -hmm. uh, and so they're deciding, well, we have economies of scale across 50 different companies. One of the things that, um, I found interesting about Motive is this extensive wealth ecosystem mm. that you've built and the opportunities to collaborate. I think people might be interested in seeing that and maybe you could give one or two examples. Yeah. Um, so uh, it's, it's very true we have a large um, ecosystem, it's probably the right word, overused, but nonetheless. Uh, of, of portfolio companies that in and around the wealth tech space. Um, and, and all of them in some way are manifestations of the, some of the trends I just talked about. Um, so uh, several years ago, we acquired a, a company focused in Europe and Asia uh, on providing software to enable uh, uh, wealth advisors uh, private banks, insurers, uh, independent financial advisors to interact with their customers. So front-end uh, technology system, modern technology. Uh, great company on a standalone uh, basis. 
foundation of a of a port, of a uh, platform play, but but small and re regionally focused. A couple of years later, uh, although a year or eighteen months later, we uh, carved out uh, of Fiserv um, a non-core asset, somewhat unloved, underinvested in as a consequence, also in the wealth space, but it, it it's a post trade. So it's the, the middle office capability for, for, substantial, for a very large, uh, substantial portion of the uh, managed accounts here in the United States. Not obvious connection to that. Uh, but then not very long later, uh, we came across, uh, well, had been in hot pursuit of, it's probably more accurate, for some time. And, and finally, um, convinced an entrepreneur, uh, not because we came bearing money, nor because we came promising a high valuation, um, although both were somewhat true, uh, but what we came bearing was those two other assets. And what we said is, this is our vision. Now what this company, this third company did, its name is InvestCloud. Um, what this company was is an ultra-modern, cloud-based, uh, API interfaced, um, beautifully modular um, software platform uh, using low code, no code techniques. So, what they call programs, writing programs. So, ultra uh, capable of uh, customization uh, and personalization of the interfaces in an in a, in efficient way. And we said, if we take these, this old fixer-upper that was carved out on an EBITDA multiple out of, a, of a, a, a bigger company, unloved, that's doing sort of post trade -y stuff. And remember that there's more to the world than just North America, like there's this place called Asia, which is not really a place, it's kind of lots more than that, and, and Europe, and that's interesting too. We put this together, what you have is the beginnings of the world's first fully cloud-enabled, end-to-end wealth marketplace that doesn't just help people you know, uh, connect with their customers and handle the processing, including post-trade processing and accounts and reporting and analysis and uh, all of that stuff, but actually allows people to go shopping for investable product and connects substantially all of the asset manufacturers, not, not all, but a very substantial portion of the asset manufacturers in the world to the end distributors, all the way through to the RIAs and the IFAs, the individual wealth advisors. Um, and if you, can, if you can, through technology-driven value creation, not make this you know, financial engineering where, where somehow we, we kind of smush this all together and through alchemy get the revenue-based multiple of the ultra-modern company to apply to the whole thing, but do that through actually properly integrating the technology uh, and create an offering that is a financial supermarket, you've just created something that has a chance of becoming the Amazon of financial services. And that entrepreneur said, now that is a, that's a story I'm going to listen to. And that is a firm that I'm going to partner with because they have vision and they have the assets. Uh, and that the company that is today, InvestCloud, is exactly what I just described. So the whole thing is now under one umbrella. The technology is well advanced in the process of being fully integrated. It is truly global, and it has six and a half trillion dollars of assets flowing through its pipes as a consequence, which is extraordinary. Uh, I have not mentioned several other wealth-related uh, assets in the ecosystem. I already mentioned Forge, um, which is a marketplace for private equity securities, another company that rhymes with that in the sense of the same, uh, the same uh, mega trends that it plays on is a company called Case, who operates a platform for the distribution of private equity funds, private credit, private real estate, private, uh, private equity, to RIAs, IFAs, et cetera, uh, independent broker-dealers. Uh, another is Wilshire, uh, the uh, uh, venerable, well-known company uh, that has uh, tremendous uh, indexing capabilities as well as analytics and advisory and asset management capabilities. Uh, well, if I remember FNZ. correctly, aren't you the chair of Wilshire's Digital Asset Advisory Group? I, I am, and we, we spend time focusing on creating a taxonomy and, and index products for digital assets, which is a lot harder than it sounds. 
um, and is useful in the world where institutional investors are trying to approach a, a, a bewildering asset class with very little standardization. But, uh, uh, and recently we've added to that family uh, a, a late, a late stage uh, growth investment in FNZ, uh, which is uh, a, a, a core, um, uh, has similar, some similar uh, characteristics to InvestCloud, but a bigger non-US present. Uh, very interesting synergies between all of these. So the opportunity, for example, to have a Forge talk to a Wilshire about index product based on their proprietary information associated with where private equity securities have traded in the last 12 years, uh, or to plug Forge's uh, product into the evolving financial supermarket that is InvestCloud and so on. These connection points between uh, the growing ecosystem of wealth assets is, is, uh, is really what drives uh, value creation and is super exciting for all of those companies. So Blythe, let's go into a different marketplace for a few minutes. And that's the SPAC marketplace. Mm. Redemptions are high, deals are breaking. There's five to 600 of them today seeking targets. You've launched a successful SPAC. You are the head of uh, uh, Motive Capital Corp. Corp. One. Growth and two. two. And two. two. Yeah. We viewed as an investor SPACs as a very interesting opportunity in that uh, we could get a higher rate at the time, call it two, three percent minimum. If we sold warrants and just held them, they were two year paper. And sometimes there were good things that could happen. And that worked very well for about a year. Uh, today we look at our SPAC portfolio that will all run off in the next 12 months from that standpoint. Why did Motive focus on the SPAC? So uh, I, I think the right way to describe it is we saw it as a way of expanding our toolkit. Um, we, we did not jump into the first wave of SPAC euphoria. SPACs have been longer around, as you know, for longer than most people realize, actually. But the, the first wave of, the recent wave of euphoria, we, we stayed out of, and we didn't, we didn't issue a, our first SPAC until December of 2020. Um, and that, uh, that vehicle just de into what is today the public company Forge. Um, we waited uh, because we were building motive, both raising our first and then our uh, second fund, um, and building the ecosystem of companies and, and people and skills. And what we saw in the SPAC market was uh, some companies that went company went public via that avenue that probably should never have been public companies, and some sponsors who were, shall we say, less than entirely credible. Um, and we thought that by uh, taking a slightly different approach than many others, we could uh, be a differentiated proposition, especially from the point of view of the entrepreneur seeking to take her company public or his company public. Um, and, and how we did that was that uh, we raised the, the, the public capital um, sponsored by motive, not by a, an individual. It wasn't me as an individual or Rob, as, Rob Hayford, our founding partner, as an individual. It was motive. And we backed the vehicle with a forward purchase agreement, which is a commitment to acquire the public shares of the uh, combined business combination that was written from our private equity funds uh, to the tune of $140 million in the case of SPAC number one and $100 million in the slightly smaller SPAC number two. And what that brought was a degree of transaction execution certainty uh, for the company making a decision to go public. Um, so that on the day that we announced that we were combining businesses with Forge, we, had, we raised a pipe uh, and backed it, this with our $140 million of our private equity investors' money. Uh, and the sum of that modestly sized pipe and the $140 million was enough to meet 
the minimum cash condition of the deal. And so the company was no longer at uh, the mercy of redemption rates. And obviously, pretty much since that day, redemption rates have tracked up and up and up and up and up to the point where the, the, if they're not at 100, it's because someone has essentially given up the sponsor economics to ensure that they're not at 100, which we, we did not have to do in this case. And, and so Forge knew pretty much since the day of the announcement of the transaction that they would be going public with at least a certain amount of cash to the balance sheet that they needed in order to do what they did. And that was a genuinely differentiated value proposition, and it gave us an opportunity to do business with a company that was done with its rounds of private capital, had a very good case for going public. It's actually a business that uh, uh, traffics in the pre-IPO shares of unicorns. Um, and so for investors to have a, an avenue for playing on a, a long-term structural view about the ongoing growth and attractiveness of private capital markets, in a public markets vehicle was a really interesting story. And, and that's actually why the stock has, you know, which has been trading anywhere from, well, anywhere from on day one at sort of 12 all the way up to 44. And I don't know where we are this five minutes, but probably 17 or $18. Um, it's, you know, one of the most, uh, you know, popular SPACs in the marketplace. Right. So that, I think that reflects good choice of company, the structure we used, having our money where our mouths was, were, uh, and uh, not every SPAC looks like that. Are SPACs dead? No, I think uh, the public markets are a very uncomfortable place to be trying to make your debut this five minutes, whether it's via a SPAC or via an IPO. Um, but the reality is, is that, uh, e and even with the proposed changes coming in from the SEC, which I think really codify to a large extent best practice that many of the better quality sponsors and companies were using anyway, for example, you know, get a fairness opinion. I mean, 85% of M&A transactions involving public companies do that. Why would you not do that in the, in the SPAC case? We, we did that, uh, we were one of only 15% of SPACs that did that at the time. And um, you're one of probably less than 15% that's selling a substantial premium mm -hmm. today. But you also committed the talent of your firm with a straight company, face right? and a clean conscience because the promote didn't flow to one or two people it flowed to the investors in our private equity funds and gave them a higher return than they could have achieved right. by well, just buying the stock. Well, we say thank you for that. Blake. Absolutely. So, You're welcome. I want to <laughs> It ain't over yet because uh, we own a lot and it's, yeah. you know, there's a long way to go. So <laughs> I'd like to Great take company. our conversation in another direction. Mm. Uh, you've had a front row seat as director of, of companies, of an international you know, great company like Credit Suisse to see what's going to occur. Before most of the people watching us today, yes, you were born uh, in 74, I pointed out that if you believed in reincarnation and you had led a very bad life, you would be reincarnated as the CEO of a utility. Why? <laughs> Nothing good can happen, okay? If you did nuclear power and you're providing low cost, they might decide, well, we don't like nuclear power anymore. If you were doing hydropower and it didn't rain, it didn't really do you any good if you were hydropower. If you had oil and it went to a huge premium, you had problems. So there was very little. And if you tried to turn off a person who wasn't paying their utility bill, uh, they could freeze to death. You couldn't do that either. So, Today, when you look at all the issues in the world, the war in Ukraine, the changes in access to wheat or other food stocks, what's occurred with Russia from this period, issues with China or other parts of the world, obviously you've had to think about in so many different ways in running commodities is what are the risks? What are the risks in every form, in every financial market, but whether it was commodities or whether it was currencies or whether it was lending, do you believe we are overstating risk in this market today, understating, and what risk uh, in your role of being responsible is either a board member or uh, in your previous responsibilities, do you believe maybe aren't getting sufficient attention today? Well, that's an easy question. 
Well, I didn't want to give you any really easy questions. Uh, yeah. We could have got someone of less talent up here. <laughs> we could have asked a lot of easy questions. Um, okay. Uh, I think I mentioned earlier this, this, this question of post-quantum cr cryptography. It's related also to cyber-related uh, risk. I, I th a lot has been written about the, the potential for one of the dimensions of the direct war and then the wars that are being waged via proxy. Um, effectively between the United States and Russia. It's a strong statement, but I think in terms of, from a risk point of view, I think people understand that that was not a political statement. It was a risk statement. I think a lot has been written about the potential for cyber to become an important axis of that. Uh, and I would say, given uh, the particularly weak state and um, underinvested state of US infrastructure, um, the, the US is very is vulnerable uh, there, despite being a great country and a great comp economy and uh, in many ways self-sufficient food, energy, human capital, water in some but not all places. Um, the United States has, has got crumbling infrastructure that, that is vulnerable. Um, and that, that is uh, true whether you're thinking about financial infrastructure, the, the electrical grid, water, cities, transportation, bridges, air traffic control, I, you know, nuclear power, you could go on. Um, so that, that, that concerns me a lot. Um, the bigger issue that I don't think many of us uh, have really lived through long enough to be able to say, oh, well, I was there when this happened, is what the, what the medium, nearish, you know, to medium term implications of all of this are to the social fabric of the world uh, and the um, implications of what was already uh, an exacerbated gap between the wealthy and the rest, the very small number of wealthy and the rest, the very large number of the, west, of the rest, and the ways in which the extraordinary impact that this uh, conflict is having on supply chains, food supply in particular, and energy supply are going to impact people who are likely going to be suffering the other con sort of conventional experiences of recession, meaning loss of jobs, loss of disposable income. There's a lot of analysis that, that shows that uh, in many countries in Western Europe, very, very high percentage of disposable income uh, will be, are being eradicated through the increase in raw material costs, food costs, energy costs. And you know, what happens when you eradicate a large, a large percentage or all of the disposable income of a large part of the population is, you know, the next time an election goes or comes around, something unexpected happens. So the risk of regime, and, th and this is in, you know, Western Europe. So if you think that's challenging, then extrapolate to many other uh, less, less stable places in the world, and, it, and that becomes a... Uh, uh, a, a very concerning prospect. On the one hand, I think we read so much in the press about the way that uh, Europe has rallied and NATO has been strengthened as a perverse uh, effect of Putin's uh, decisions. And we're all lulled into this false sense of security that everybody is 100% aligned and pointing in the same direction and agreeing on the same priorities and heading, you know, and completely, you know, we have consensus that we're going to stand, that we do not have consensus. It's, it's summer. It's summertime. It, things are going to, it's going to get cold and th this coming winter is going to be a very, very, very difficult time uh, in, in Europe in particular. Um, and, and you saw what happened in the recent French election. Um, you, you, 
which, well, what nearly happened, what didn't happen in the end. But I, I think there's a real risk of the comfortable status quo that we're sort of used to bumbling along uh, in Europe, uh, really fraying not just at the edges, but at the core. Um, and this is before you start worrying about, you know, what is the risk that things escalate? And, and I'm just imagining a scenario where the current situation continues for potentially years. Um, so to me, that, it, that risk of, of social unrest, regime change, not of the type that we're you know, hoping for, um, and, the, the, and, and the implications for all of that, which will be caused by the jaws of high inflation and what will become negative growth. Blythe, one of the reports I wait for every year to really focus on is put out by Credit Suisse, and that is the breakdown of the wealth report of the world that mm -hmm. it puts out. And um, it often uh, shows you the wealth effect throughout the world. And the United States, in the last report, has the highest percentage of its population, any country over 20 million, uh, that are millionaires. It was 8.3% in the last report. Just think, 8.3% of a population are millionaires, and we could attribute that to a number of factors, the stock market going up, but particularly the rise in value of homes or condominiums in the country. But on the other side of the coin, 28%, I believe, was the last number of people in the United States have a net worth under 10,000. So when you looked at developed countries in the world, the US had the highest percentage on this report of people under 10,000 and the highest percentage of people over a million. And when you think about the change in interest rates that have occurred on mortgages, for the average home in the United States, the cost of the mortgage has risen by 50% due to interest rates. So physical assets that we think about, and not, not everyone in this room thinks that way, but it's the monthly payment, whether it's a house, whether it's the car. And so I, I have to agree with you on this last issue, and let's couple that with two years of a pandemic. Mm -hmm. And thinking about all the children that were in school that had a different experience, might not have been able to go to a graduation, don't know what occurred. And so I think this regime change that you spoke about that we're seeing uh, is a really underlying factor that I don't believe we're taking in the rest. The former one we're hoping you'll help solve the crypto uh, problems. We hope you'll solve the idea of security on digital assets. Um, but we're not going to hold you accountable today for world peace uh, and dealing with those issues. Maybe next year, if we sit here together, we'll put you on that list. So Blythe, thank you so much. It's always a pleasure.